Welcome to our Wednesday night video. As we continue to look at 1 Corinthians, we're in chapter 4 this evening. We'll get right on that in just a minute. Let me give you a couple of announcements first. First thing I wanted to let you know is that our membership class is this Saturday at 9 o'clock. We'll probably go to right around 12. Uh, I am recording it for anyone who is interested in membership and is unable to attend because we already have a couple of people like that. So I wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, this Sunday, we will be having our normal service and communion, and then Sunday evening, we will be meeting at six o'clock. Then the next uh, notable thing on our schedule after that is our men's prayer breakfast. That's March 16th at 9 a.m., so two Saturdays from this Saturday. And I think that's it as I'm kind of looking at the um, bulletin here. So, as always, if you have any questions schedule-wise or if you want to be involved in serving in the church or anything, please see me. We want to be a church family that uh, is living in community together, even though we're not always corporately together, and loving each other and serving each other. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch to... Oh, got lost for a second here. Um, sharing my screen. I couldn't find it. All right, so there, I think you should see the PowerPoint coming up in just a minute. All right, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. I have been mentioning my um, desktop computer, still not fixed. I ordered some parts. And uh, so hopefully sometime soon it'll be ready so that I can do the videos where we have the music from Sundays, the nice transitions and everything. But in the meantime, we'll just make do with my laptop. So 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 21, Paul ends and summarizes his appeal to the Corinthians to seek God's wisdom and humility. The appeal and the exhortation are in verses 14 through 21. As we can see, it is a longer section that began in chapter 1, verse 10, goes all the way to chapter 6, verse 20, but this specific section is there, letter A, you see, a church divided internally and against Paul. This is the last part of that. In chapter 5, he will actually begin to deal with things he has been told that he needs to give apostolic authority on. So here's the introduction. Paul finally comes to the end of his admonition to the Corinthians that started in chapter 1, verse 10. There's a sense here in which he summarizes the importance of everything he has said thus far by reminding them of his love for them and authority over them, exhorting them to imitate him in his ways, stressing the sending of Timothy to apply all this to their lives, and planning to visit them himself to personally apply everything. Before he moves on to address specific concerns in the next chapter, he pleads with them to apply the realities of God's wisdom, humility, unity, and so on for their benefit. All right, so let's look at the verses together. Beginning in verse 14, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless, and in the Greek that's actually 10,000 guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent, and the Greek could be, or am sending you, Timothy. So he's either sent him already, or he's going to send Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God it does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? All right, so those are the verses. Uh, I do want to remind you, I will not have these verses on the individual slides, so you may want to have your Bibles open if you're following along with the video. Let's ask a couple general questions first. Initial observations, thoughts, or questions. As always, that letter is always there. A uh, chance for you to go through the passage yourself. Then secondly, how would you briefly describe the passage? Here's my answer. Because of love for them and desire for their good, Paul stresses his authority over the Corinthians as their spiritual father, urging them to model his ways and sending Timothy to help them. He plans to personally visit them also for their good, whether it is authoritatively or gently. All right, so let's look at the individual verses. 
letter A, before we look at the individual verses, it's important to notice how Paul grounds everything. He uses the word in Christ or in the Lord four times, uh, specifically in verses 15 through 17. So let me just read those to you. Verse 15, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And then in verse 17, he says, that is why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child, in the Lord to remind you of my ways in Christ, okay? So uh, four times there, and then through the gospel, as I read once in verse 15. How is this the basis for his exhortations? This is the way we interpret scripture, that grace comes before doing anything, and shapes and enables any doing. As it is anywhere else, Paul is making sure there's never a disconnect from who we are in Christ, the realities of the gospel, and his enabling grace in what he says to do. So he's telling them to do things all through this book already, but he, as always, grounds it in, in Christ, in the gospel. That grace, our union with Jesus, all the gospel benefits that we enjoy as God's dearly loved children are the basis and the enabling and the strength and the power to do what God tells us to do. Jesus is our basis in power because of the fact that he's already done these things in his life and because of the fact that we dwell in him and his spirit dwells us, we're united to him, his doing of them uh, is not only our example, but our enabling for us to walk in Christ-likeness. Okay, letter B then, as we start to look at the individual verses. Discuss why you believe Paul says what he does in verse 14 and why it's important. He says, I do not write these things to you to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. He has thus far said some confrontational, though true, things. He's um, admonished them for their pride, their divisiveness, their immaturity, um, their crit critical spirit of him, their seeking of the wisdom of the world, okay? So therefore, here he reminds the Corinthians that it is not to hurt, but to help them because of his love for them as his children in Christ. And so we understand this. We often, with our own children, say hard things to them, admonish them, confront them, discipline them, all of these things, not to hurt them, but because we want what's good for them and we love them. All right, I think that's there pretty obvious in verse 14. Now to verse 15. So what is Paul referring when he mentions countless guides in Christ in verse 15? So he says, for though you have countless, again, in Greek, that's 10,000 guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. The countless guides would be the ministers that Paul has mentioned, uh, specifically Apollos, Peter himself, or e even others, maybe um, those in the Corinthian church or others that maybe Paul hasn't mentioned that the Corinthians were inclined to think that's my favorite one and I'm part of their tribe. But he elevates his own role as the planter of this church and the one who in that role was a spiritual father to them. You can actually find that in Acts chapter 18 verse, verses 1 through 11 as he goes to Corinth and as he plants the church. So he compares this to his own role in saying, I was the planter and I'm your spiritual father. So there's a uniqueness to the relationship and authority that I have with and over you to be telling you these things. And you need to remember that as I'm telling you these things. I'm your father who, spiritual father, who, who loves you. I, I invested in your life and I want your good. And that's why I'm telling you these things. And that also carries with it authority. So not just love and relationship, but authority. So they need to listen to him. Uh, and then uh, why is this important? This is important because his appeals to them come from this relationship and there is God-given authority as this idea of this father that he says, you don't have a lot of those. You got may, may have a lot of ministers that you tend to think are your favorites, but you don't have any fathers. I'm one. I planted the church. I invested in your lives for all that time. And so therefore the love and the authority shape the way you should respond. Okay, letter D. Verse 16 is one with which we are all likely familiar uh, it says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. You probably have heard that verse. Uh, pretty self-explanatory in a lot of ways, but knowing the context, what do you think Paul is stressing? So first of all, kind of the general way that we typically think of it. Certainly there's a general sense in which he can tell them to act like him, his ways in Christ, as verse 17 will mention. And by the way, that's something that we should all strive for, to be able to say to others, 
as I follow Christ, uh, imitate that pattern, that model. We will never do it perfectly. We don't want to elevate ourselves. But in that Paul says that there is a category for those who are following Christ and being made more like him and honoring him and glorifying him, treasuring him, all these things that they can say to those uh, upon whom they have impact, um, model these things that are good. Throw out the things in which I fail, but model the things which are good. So there's a general sense of that that Paul certainly is saying. But he's particularly appealing to them to imitate him in the humility and embracing of God's wisdom he has stressed because of his love and authority. So that, that, that that's what this whole context is about, the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world. Um, humility, maturity, divisiveness, pride, boasting, all of these things. Christ as the foundation of the church, everything he's mentioned, and the way he lives those things out, particularly in humility and God's wisdom. He says, imitate that uh, because I love you and because I have this fatherly relationship and authority with you. So that's really important in this text. Then letter E, what is the nature of Paul sending Timothy in verse 17? Verse 17 says, that is why I sent, and again, the Greek could be, am sending you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I, te as I teach them everywhere in every church. He has sent or will send Timothy to emphasize in person all he has said and Paul's way of life in Christ that he lives and consistently teaches. That's what he means in verse 17 when he says, to remind you of my ways in Christ. So Timothy is to tell them by verbal, verbally and then also by example, this is the way that Paul lives. Uh, and then also to tell them, this is what Paul's teaching at his other churches, too. There's a consistency there. Um, and then the second question, how does this particularly relate to what he has said about being their spiritual father? There's also a unique sense in which the father-son relationship between Paul and Timothy needs to impact the Corinthians, who are also Paul's children in Christ. So you see that in the verse, that Paul is sending the one who is his beloved son in the Lord to the Corinthians— and that whole dynamic, this is who Timothy is. He's responded to being my son uh, in, in the faith, in Christ. And that uniqueness should rub off on you, Corinthians. And so I think there's a specificity to that that is really important. He's saying to them, imitate me. Listen to what I've said. I'm your spiritual father. I have authority. I love you. I don't want to hurt you. This is for your good. And so the best thing that I can do is send the one who is the model of all of this uh, to tell you the way I am, to tell you what I teach in the church, but also be a living example of this idea of someone who has embraced what the father said to the son. And again, this is all in the Lord in Christ, enabled by grace, with the Spirit inside us, because we are loved and we, we love him and we worship him in response. In verse 17, how do Paul's ways in Christ, as he teaches them in every church, relate to the context? We've already read the verse. His ways in Christ could refer to his general Christ-enabled character and behavior, and certainly that would be a part of it, so there's a generality there. Or, Contextually, specifically, the ways he demonstrates the wisdom of God and humility that he has stressed. So he's saying, Timothy is going to tell you and show you, this is the way I am. So as I've stressed to you, don't embrace the wisdom of the world. Um, kill boasting. Don't, don't be divisive and have favorites. And don't build wrongly on the foundation of Christ. Uh, make the uh, Christ crucified alone, the center of your life, all of these things. He's saying, Timothy's going to tell and show you that that is who I am all of the time. I, I, I'm not duplicitous and telling you this and living another way. He's consistent in his living and the fact that he teaches it. So he teaches the Corinthians the same thing he would teach to any other uh, uh, local church that he has planted as he sends a letter or talks to them or whatever. And then letter E, to end this plea, what does Paul say in verses 18 through 21? What stands out here and how does it relate to the context. He states, so let me read the verses again, uh, I, I just uh, kind of summarizing these three verses. Uh, some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. So he's, you know, maybe referring to the ones who are actually super critical of him, saying that uh, he's weak in speech. Um, Apollos is a lot better. So they're arrogant. 
And they're thinking, well, he's not going to come, so he can't challenge us on our arrogance, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I'll find out not to talk of these arrogant people, but their power. So he's essentially saying kind of one of the phrases that we would use, talk is cheap. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And he's demonstrating the kingdom of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, the spirit of God is truly present and working in the way he models his life, not the wisdom of the world that the Corinthians have sought. And then he ends it, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? He states there are some who are arrogant, picking up on the idea of the criticism of him that he's ha having to defend. They're like this because they think he won't come to defend himself and confront their error, but if the Lord wills, he will do so. Their talk stands against the actual power of God's wisdom, which Paul models, humility, the spirit, the wisdom of God. That is what God empowers, and Paul appeals to that. He asks them if they want the nature of his visit to be confrontational or gentle. Obviously, the preference would be gentle if they respond to what he's saying here. This brings to a decision point how the church need to process, needs to process what he said thus far. Okay, so before he moves to chapter 5 with some specific things he's going to talk, beginning with sexual immorality and how that defiles the church, he's challenging, challenging them to respond to what he said thus far in the letter. Okay, and so then you see final thoughts and application. Do you have any final observations, comments, or questions? How do you think you can apply the truths this passage to your life? All right, hope that's a blessing to you. Let me stop the sharing uh, there on my screen, get back to just the screen of my face. All right, so uh, again, I hope you're blessed by that, and uh, it's my pleasure to do these videos. I want to encourage you, if you're here on Sundays, to make sure you're grabbing these bulletins. So if that kind of shapes the way that you're pray praying throughout the week, uh, I will pray now and um, in the video in just a couple of minutes. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm so grateful for your word and how it challenges us and comforts us. Thank you for the example that Paul is. And I pray that, they will, that we will apply these things to our life. Thank you most of all that your son has accomplished everything to bring us to you in faith in grace, and uh, forgive us for our sins and give us every other salvation benefit. And I praise you that that is the basis for this, then living humbly and um, just all the things that Paul says, walking in wisdom. And uh, may we continue to appropriate gospel realities that then will compel and motivate and be the basis for the things you tell us to do. And uh, walking through sanctification. Please bless all the needs that are in our church, whether they're physical needs or emotional or spiritual or relational, whatever they are. Thank you that you are uh, infinitely wise and you love us and you know what's going on. You know how you're going to answer and thank you for the power of prayer. And I pray for our church that your hand of power will be upon it. Uh, may we continue to realize how desperate we are, we are for your grace, for your enabling grace, and continue to plead with you for it and to apply these things that we've already studied here on Wednesdays, on Sundays, just as we're together for other studies, whatever they would be. We ask all these things in the name of your son. Amen. All right, everybody, it's been a pleasure to be with you. If you need anything between now and Sunday, please let me know, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Goodbye.